Um, we have Ma Ma Marie, Mary, <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and Diane with us, and they were both part of our book club that read this wonderful creation. And I know they've got lots of questions. I've got some questions from the other members as well that couldn't make it today. Um, but I guess I'll start off with the first one, which would be kind of what your main inspiration behind writing Splinters of Sunshine was. Because um, I always think that's a good question to start with. <laughs> a big one, but a good one. <laughs> I think most of my books are usually a mixture of lots of things that have been sort of mulling, stroke, festering, stroke, sort of accumulating in the sort of back of my head. Uh, the first really was um, uh, DNA Dad, Benny. So I really liked him because he's like a main character, a sort of well, a secondary character in Splinters yeah. of, um, oh, sorry, in um, Eight Pieces of Silver. And he's trying to make all these amends to his children. So I thought, hmm, what's next? Um, so I kind of wanted to bring him in. I've worked a lot in the uh, voluntary and charity sector and I've worked with organisations that work with the families of prisoners. And also, I mean, I speak a lot about this when I do visits in secondary schools. My own biological dad was in prison for a month when he was, I suppose, relatively young for just for um, forging a cheque. But that kind of just, you know, he couldn't be a nurse again. And it was like just sent him on this sort of domino effect of, of sort of bad things. So I'm really interested in those other narratives because there's this kind of big narrative that, you know, prison is a, is a, a holiday camp and it's easy, but it's actually not at all. It's full of people struggling and lots of people who do want to do the right thing but can't. So that was very much my mind. And then the beginning of it was um, about two, three years ago. Me and my daughter, who's probably, who's probably about 18 or 19, 18 maybe at the time. Maybe. Um, See, we didn't get round to decorating our Christmas tree until Christmas Eve. So we were decorating our Christmas tree. We had Queen on Spotify <laughs> loudly. <laughs> I was singing along. I introduced her to Advocar and Eliminate Snowball. <laughs> <laughs> so basically seized our Christmas Eve <laughs> as an opening scene for a book. Because I think yeah. the video still exists, but I paid a good money not to show it to anybody of me <laughs> dancing around to sort of some of the songs. So, so that was just really like the start of it. So I was really interested in Spain, his mum's relationship, and just having that real difference of him being relatively middle class, high achieving, and his dad comes into, into his life and they go on a road trip. And <laughs> the final thing is actually moved from London to Hastings. And I was born in Brighton. So all of those things pop up in the yeah. book as well so I'm very good at seizing everything from real life and I like just shoving it in my book. <laughs> I think that really comes across though like I know um, the other two will agree that it feels very real and very set in the real world so that totally makes sense that you kind of take elements from the real world to put in your books because it was very hard hitting for us when we was reading it um, and really nice to be able to connect to it as well because I think sometimes when um, books try and kind of explore those it can feel a little less real or it can feel almost like it's a tv show running in front of you but I think this was very like oh <laughs> But at the same Very time, like, it didn't feel like anything had been put in for sort of shock value. It felt like everything was really genuine and really, really plausible. Um, so I work, um, I work with children and young people. I used to work in forensic mental health settings and I now work for children's services. So I have quite a lot of experience of working with children who have been involved with trans lines and stuff like that and I felt like it was written in such an accessible way um rather than I don't know oh I can't work all day my head's not working properly but <laughs> being this all like don't do this because this is gonna happen it was very like it was really accessible and really relatable and believable um so yeah i I loved that. Oh, thank you. I think for me it's really important and I think it's a similar event to Go Donut that if young people who have had those experiences read those books 
my books they feel relatable mm. and I want you know and I suppose for me it's always about individuals because sometimes these things get this glamorous like county line sounds glamorous and it's this but actually it's young people and it's vulnerable young people quite yeah. often and another thing when I was writing it, it's one of my good friends is an intermediary so she works supports vulnerable people whether they're adults or children or young people to give evidence so it might be around disclosure it might be evidence in court and helps them give the best evidence so she had supported a young person who was involved, um, who was, I suppose, drawn into sort of the county lines in, uh, in Cornwall. So, so she sort of, it was all sort of, it was all very, um, you know, it's high profile, it's in the news and, and everything. So she yeah. sort of, you know, talked to her about it as well. But it was just really, that struck me, the vulnerability of the young people and about how people, you know, people have that power prey on young people who are vulnerable. And then once you're drawn into that, how, how do you get out of it? Who are you if you're not part of that? Mm. And for me, Dee, I wanted Dee to be vulnerable because she is vulnerable, but I just didn't want her to come across as just this very passive victim. So one of the reasons she has a wildflowers is I wanted to give her her own poetry because mm. she hasn't really had, you know, had a chance to explore vocabulary. She's been in and out of school. She's suffered loss and bereavement and, and violence, but I really wanted her to have poetry. So I kind of wanted her to, in a sense, you know, she's gone through all of these things, but she still has just that little bit of, of her power, I think, and a little bit of, of, of hope. Because again, you know, for any young person reading that who's involved in a similar situation, I want them to know that they have a voice and that, and that they have hope. I think that that for me was really, really powerful. Again, I feel like all of us, um, work in really similar backgrounds so I'm actually a secondary school teacher myself and I um, have worked in schools of really really deprived areas and so we've had a lot of involvement with county lines and things like that as well and for me what really struck me with your novel and it's something that I don't see frequently when I read young adult books or as frequently as I'd like to see is the representation of disenfranchised backgrounds and I think that that's really that really struck me because I thought you know this is a book that I could give to students of mine that I know are involved in this and which they'll be like oh this this is this is something I can be familiar with and recognize myself in and see the friends that I'm involved with in and I thought that that was so powerful and it's just like you said Dee was extremely vulnerable but also had her own a little bit of power that she was trying to kind of hold on to and I thought that that was so beautifully done and eloquently done in the book. Oh thank you because that, that was really important to me and then because when I start writing the book I, I always think about whose point of view and whose voices I'm writing it in and I think initially with uh, Splinter of Sunshine, Spain, in a sense, came first, because for me, it's about the reconnection between father and son, who were very, very different. And then I thought I did want Benny's voice, but I didn't want Benny's voice to be in the text too much. Mm -hmm. And also he, you know, struggles in a sense with articulating himself, but in a different way from D. So that's why he does his through the letters, because he's really worried about his literacy. Because again, he's got going up in the care system at a very disjointed education. And having, you know, done um, coordinated writing workshops in prisons and, and done events in prisons, there's, literacy is a really, really big issue, you know, in, in prisons. So it was kind of him and Spay really contrasting. And then when Dee came in, it, I thought, again, that I, again, something about young women have an agency. So I'm not going to have her there unless she has her own voice as well. So it's really important for me to have, to have her own voice. Um, and hopefully, yeah, hopefully. And also, I was really lucky as well that um, Michelle Brackenborough, who designs the covers for my YA, she sort of came up with the, why don't we do bot botanical drawings of, of, of the wildflowers? Like, yes, please. <laughs> so it was lucky. And that just added, again, that little bit of creativity and artistry to Dee's section that gave us that little lift as well. Yeah, I loved the like illish like I look I've just opened yeah. it on the right page that never <laughs> happened I loved just the little illustrations and things I think it really gave the chapters like that added like touch of kind of like personality as well absolutely yeah absolutely you, yeah. Uh, I thought you'd opened it on exactly the same page then <laughs> <laughs> and I was like how is that happening magic magic I remember when I saw that when I saw that image for the first time it's like oh my gosh like, <laughs> That's great, that is. I was like, yeah, I was all made up with that. 
Yeah, and I th I think it works really well to just like highlight D as well. Just like absolutely, it works so well. And I always love an illustration anyway. I think yeah. illustrations in books are amazing, and um, they they always put a little smile on my face. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was yeah. grinning when I saw it. So. <laughs> I'm not so surprised. Happy. <laughs> they are absolutely beautiful. Like the cover as well is gorgeous. Like beautiful. the amount of people that love like, the cover pick it up just because of how I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but like you do. I do all the time. time. All the time. <laughs> we all do really. And it's just like I, but it's also one of those covers that I see and then when I read the book totally makes sense as well which I really it's, like well it's because Michelle reads the books so she's actually um she's employed by Hachette so she's not freelance so she all of the books she's done all the covers and she reads them all and then she pulls out all the ideas and does mood boards and really thinks about it and she's really passionate about the detail of the books and uh and she'll come back and she'll change and she made dandelion biscuits for me <laughs> <laughs> so because we had like a local because my local bookshop a tastings um bookshop so with a little ranch she made a unfortunately the, the couriers didn't pick them up in time so he couldn't have them so like got them the next day gave some to the people in water stones gave some to the people in hastings bookshop gave some to my neighbors they were great she made special bunting for me as well she sort of photocopied the petals onto photographic paper and then oh. cut them all out and made bunting she's just amazing really amazing and she just, you can tell, as you know, to say about the covers, that she's absolutely passionate about it and will really come at it, finding, finding the thing that connects her. And afterwards, I learned that she really likes botanical drawings. So it's like, woo, you know. But all of my books, even stuff that she wouldn't think she would know about, she finds out about it and finds the thing that she relates to and just makes these brilliant covers. I'm just so lucky to have had her. Well, I feel like we just got a lot of insider information. I feel really privileged. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If you, if you follow Michelle, if you if you on Instagram, follow Michelle Brackenborough on Instagram because she posts up some of her other covers as well, and she really gets into the writing the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Diana came with her own notebook this evening. Um, she was <laughs> like, "I'm going to get so many notes." <laughs> I'm I'm prepared, very prepared. <laughs> You can't see, but there's notebooks scattered way all over this, uh, the uh, carpet in front of me. So, yeah. Oh, good, good. No. That's good. That that makes me feel much happier. <laughs> so, it is a me. in that case, would you like to ask the next question if you've got one? Diane? Oh well, <laughs> why won't I talk? then? <laughs> um, one thing that I did notice that you sort of t mentioned about already was kind of the real kind of gave, giving agency to characters like Dee and Benny, especially because of their lack of kind of wording, I suppose, or, or way for them to express themselves. And so I thought it was, I thought it was quite an interesting commentary on how um, there is power in education and power in kind of accessing that opportunity to get out of certain situations that socially you're pushed into because of the system, I suppose. I wonder if that was an intentional thing that you did no not really because I kind of have mixed views I suppose I think in terms of prison I think prison I mean Alex Wheatle often talks about you know that he learned to read when he was in prison so he had a really you know he's very open he had a very difficult upbringing um ended up in prison in sort of Brixton and found the library and learned to read and that fueled his you know his his love of reading and sort of love of writing and I think, you know, if people, if they invest in prisons and invest in rehabilitation, I think there are those opportunities. I mean, there's some fantastic libraries in prisons. Unfortunately, many are so short, have so sh few staff that there's no one to take the people down to them. I actually did an, uh, an event in HMP Thamesmead, which is um, in sort of southeast London, which is kind of like a remand, so it's got almost like revolving door. So that was about, I think it was either January 2020 or sort of towards the end of, of 2019. And we did it about Orange Boy because my uh, publishers donated 20 um, Orange Boys and it was arranged by Neil, the librarian, who's sort of fantastic. So it was full capacity, I think 20, 25 
men and they all got a book which is fantastic and I sort of talked and we signed them and, and that was great and then I did another event about a month ago but the library has been closed all that time since lockdown so the men have been stuck in their prison in their cells maybe like 23 hours you know that chance to be amongst books is absolutely lost so they've got a book club and this time I had to record a video which because they can't have memory sticks and the internet had to be <laughs> downloaded onto a DVD by a special company. And we sent some splinters of sunshine and I did like some questions as well about, is this relatable for the book club? So I haven't got, you know, the answers back, but it's really interesting to see if actually that experience of being a father in, in prison. I think schools are really difficult for people, young people who don't fit in. I think the system isn't set up for young people no, who agree. don't fit in. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think a lot of adults now who talk about, you know, the experience, for instance, of being dyslexic and about how they're made to feel very stupid. I think young people, all of us learn different things at different times and school is there. And particularly, you know, when there was the, you know, the league tables and parental choice and then a curriculum, which is still the same curriculum that I did when I, and I didn't even do GCSEs, I did O-levels, I'm pre-GCSE, but it's exactly the same curriculum. I think the creative writing that is, that schools are used to, to pass SATs or exams isn't the creative writing that, that, that I would encourage in young people. It's a very set type of creative writing and I think that can take away young people's voice. I think, because when I do writing workshops, you know, I say to young people, look, you do have to do that to pass your exam, but this is your voice, this is different. It doesn't, I don't care about your spelling. That's what technology is there for. If you're writing, free write, right at the top of your head, write out, you know, the subliminal stuff, get that out. And then afterwards, if you want to publish it, or worry about the spelling and all that at that time. You know, we don't talk in, in sentences and all of us, you know, necessarily in grammatical sentences and all of us come from very different backgrounds. So, you know, I just grew, grew up in a household where my mum was from Trinidad and my stepdad's Italian. It's fluent English, but of course, words get used differently and you sort of grow up thinking that's wrong. But actually, that's part of your voice, isn't it? I think, you know, working class voices, that's our voices. And it's somehow trying to give that back to young people, which I try in my books to say, we all have these really different voices, but we can all have poetry. It's just not John Donne. And it's just not, you know, what you learn in your curriculum. So it's the thing, I mean, it's so, no, I think, I'm, but saying that, it's a bit hypocritical because I'm quite lucky in that I went to a state school in Sussex that was quite high achieving. And because my mum did grow up in colonial Trinidad, all her points of reference was around British history and, and English literature. So, you know, I, I kind of knew um, you know, Kubla Khan and O to a Night and Going Along before I started secondary, you know, with collective works of Shakespeare, which would, you know, obviously served me very well to pass exams and to give me a broad understanding of what, well, not broad, a understanding of what literature could be. But as I grew older, you know, that's when I started seeking out books by um, black writers and by LGBTQI writers, because that wasn't part of your curriculum. So that was expanding my own world, I think. Mm, yeah. So there's something about self-education, isn't there? And about the agency we give young people to explore for themselves and around critical thinking and allowing them to ask questions about what they have to learn and why. And then finding out the answers, not on Google, but finding out the answers <laughs> to sort of, uh, sort of broad learning. I know it's a long question because I think it's quite complicated around education and, and what it's for and who it's for. I agree and obviously the term education as well is so broad in that you can look at it as, as the, what's dictated by the curriculum or the government yeah. or you're just talking about opportunities to learn and that kind of openness to learn and expand your own knowledge like you said about self-education so yeah. You. It's also, I suppose, it's also for me, it's about having a curiosity about the world. And I don't think you mm -hmm. can be a writer unless you're curious about the world. And it's that curiosity yeah. that you quite often have in children. You know, why is the sky blue? Why do the planets? And I still have that. It's like, why does that do that? Why do, why do people do that? And for me, that's, that's that fascination about why people do what they do. And I think it's enabling young people to keep that curiosity about the world about them and then giving them the tools to know where they can go and explore different answers. And fiction is one of them, <laughs> I would say. Do you think that um, like the science society has sort of had a bit of a shift over the last few years? I mean, I feel like looking at sort of young adult books that are on the market now, I feel they're more accessible now. And I feel like young adult books tend to 
cover a wider range of like those hard hitting issues. Like I feel like Flint is such a good example of that, obviously, because it's looking at so many different sort of dynamics that sort of five, ten years ago they weren't like openly talked about in the way that they are now. And do you think that obviously your writing is contributing to that? Um, I think they always, I think, you know, I think they always have done, I suppose. I mean, I think when I was growing up, there wasn't young adult books. So you kind of went from reading children's books to sort of Agatha Christie and then through a really fantastic English, got a couple of really amazing English teachers at secondary school who really encouraged me to write and to read widely. And so one of them did a Z for Zephaniah, which is about a post-apocalyptic well and, and it's like a girl is like the main character as well you know yeah and then with mr jones we did uh paul zindel's pig man and then i went to the library and here we see them borrowed all of paul zindel's and i borrowed all the sc hinton's which is an effect i suppose um you know american ya and yeah. even though know, some of stephen king's book you know involves teenagers as well so even though it's not classified as ya so i've read sort of loads of those and they sort of you know the sc hinton's and the paul zindel's did deal with i think quite tough things at the time and I think when I was sort of reading, you know, about 15, because I never really knew that YA was a category. I just read, I, used, I would pick up the book by a cover, read the blurb and buy it. Yeah. So I remember reading uh, Patrick Ness's, um, the, um, you know, the, the Chaos Walking trilogy, the first one. And I'd never heard of him, never heard of the book, but just read it. And that deals, you know, if you look at it, it's about colonisation and it's about, it's about gender imbalance. It's about fascism. Mm. It's about some Love really... Those books. Yeah. yeah, it's really tough stuff, actually. So I think they have been there, but it's, it's I suppose, what's marketed. You know, obviously, yeah. Mallory Blackman's Noughts and Crosses is about racism and sort of, you know, uh, racial supremacy. Yeah. So I think I think it has been there. Um, it's maybe just, it depends which books just get the most promotion, I suppose, or what YA you seem to be or who makes the decisions, I think. But... Yeah. I think some of that is marketing as well. I think Absolutely. sometimes that comes down to what people want to highlight about the book. Absolutely. And whilst there might be these like incredible threads running through it, they might pick up, oh, it's a, it's a murder mystery and we're just going to mark it as such. Yeah. So I think they're easier they're a lot easier to find those not more important but those books that deal with those different issues they're easier to pick out nowadays I think is the main kind of thing that's happening because I think the market is focusing more on it I think it's social media as well so I think the fact that people can leave their own reviews and that whole sort of you know review thing has, has taken not to taking away some of the power of marketing, because that's, you know, a publisher will decide which book they want to highlight and then they will promote that to Waterstones or, or sort of, or whatever, put the money behind it. And so that will get the attention. They will send it out to the bloggers they like. But I think, you know, there is still room for the whole sort of word of mouth thing of, you know, there's just the power and the sort of, um, you know, what we as writers owe to bloggers and owe to, you know, independent bookshops and owe, and owe to people who are passionate about our books and particularly books like mine, which don't necessarily, because of the ethnicity of them, because of, you know, the stuff that I talk about, don't necessarily fit into what would be seen as YA, which I think traditionally has been marketed to middle class white young women, presumably edited by middle class, you know, white female editors yeah. who are probably thinking relating to books that you know that they read when they were younger so this is kind of cycle I think um, and kind of mine didn't fit that that cycle but it's been so lucky that that you know bookshops you know Waterstones independent bookshops librarians teachers have really really supported me and that's enabled me to carry on writing yeah support I support <laughs> Buy it. Um, Buy it now. I just lead us on to one of the questions from one of the girls that couldn't make it tonight, actually. And she was really interested with kind of YA and how you find writing the stories you write for YA. Because I do think a lot of people still think of YA as very like soft, charming tales um and how you find kind of writing 
what you write and kind of getting it into the kind of YA banner, if that makes sense. No, but there's a really slightly embarrassing answer is like when I started writing Orange Boy, I never knew that there was a category called YA. I thought I was actually writing a crime book with a 16 year old protagonist. <laughs> and um, I was part of a writing group at the time. When it, was sort of most, it was writing for adults mostly, apart from Jenny Downham, who wrote Furious Thing, is amazing and really generous mentor and supporter. And so when I sort of um, submitted these, you know, my, these, these, the opening of it for critique in my writing group, you know, Jenny said, I'm so pleased you're writing YA. And I said, it's YA. <laughs> I just didn't know. What? <laughs> and I just think, and I just think for me, because I thought I'd been on a crime writing, a residential crime writing course, I was writing crime, you know. So I think actually that was really liberating because I think I would struggle to write to a market because I just don't have those points of reference, I think. And I can only write about things that I feel really passionate about and really care about. I think living, I mean, I don't live in London now, but living in London for 25 years, you know, listening to my, my daughter, and she was a teenager and her friends talking, really caring about young people and their lives. I think for me, that is incredibly important. And then what happens is when you start writing these books and you do talks in schools, you have many young people who confide in you their own situation. So they might come up and say, oh, geez, my dad's been in prison or, you know, have a little tap on my shoulder. Geez, I was fostered because I talk about being fostered for the first sort of four years of, of my life. And so you realise, you know, that there were so many connections with, with young people. So I wouldn't want to, you know, I think for the moment, Spins of Sunshine is probably my last big YA for a moment because I think I've said what I've wanted to say for the moment. And then having like 18 months where, you know, I wasn't in London, I wasn't on buses listening to young people talk, I wasn't in schools. It would, like you say, if I wrote something now, that would be false and it wouldn't have the power of authenticity. I wouldn't know what, I'd be saying things that I didn't really know what I wanted to say. You see what I mean? So, um, yeah, for me, I think I didn't know why I existed. And I think what happened when it knew it was going to be why is I cut some of the swearing out and that was kind of only some. Um, the is other that thing, accurate though? Because I think a lot of my students swear a lot more than I do. I'm just of course saying. I do. Yeah. No, I swear a lot, but um, of course young people. But yeah. But I think the problem is is we are very aware of who, particularly with YA, you know, whether a librarian might think at school that actually parents might complain yeah. if there's if there's too much. Or and the, the other thing for me is it's very much our perhaps having the daughters about young women's agency over their own bodies. And um, particularly, I think that was with Indigo Donut, and to an extent with Dee, who has got less agency, but I want her to have hope and power, and that's her journey. But in Indigo Donut, there was a bit where, for me, Indigo, her thing was, you know, she's scared of being loved and loving people. She worries that she's inherited her dad's anger. So her whole arc is actually that's feeling so that she cool. can love and be loved. And then, so my, right, she's 17, my writing group said, you might have to write a sex scene. It's, oh God, really? <laughs> um, I just, okay, I'm going to take this as a challenge as a writer to do it. So I wrote it and in the first draft, my writing group said, too many jokes. <laughs> so, then, <laughs> so I wrote it again, but again, it's very much about young women. It's about, I wanted something that was fun and lovely and warm and awkward. You know, I don't feel that young women, again, at Suffer Around Agency and that young women if they want to be sex positive, shouldn't have to go through trauma to get there. <laughs> so I kind of wanted that. And then I wrote it a scene that I liked. And then my writing group said, yes, but Bailey isn't wearing a condom. And I'm just thinking, oh. but one, <laughs> but one, but one of the first jobs when I wrote, when I worked, came to London as I worked for books. So young people's um, sexual health, you know, advisory. Yeah. So I handed out a lot of condoms. It's very educational. <laughs> it just did tell me, actually did tell me how awful sex education is at school. And I just thought, I know none of these things. <laughs> But second thing for me is that actually, if I can't write that a, a, a woman or a young man wears a condom, how on earth would I expect a young woman to ask for one or a young man to do it? So for me, there was a really big responsibility knowing that this book would be read by young adults. So for me, though, there is that responsibility around uh, what the messaging is for me to, to teenagers. And that's, I suppose, different if I was writing for an older, or if it was being marketed to an older age group. Actually if you don't mind me cutting in, that kind of goes hand in hand with what I wanted to ask as well that I've got here. Because I thought that um, both Dee's and Spay's voice were really, um, really authentically young adults, if that makes sense. So I, I didn't feel like I was reading something written by an adult 
in through the voice of a young adult, if that if that makes any sense whatsoever. So I wonder how you get that level of kind of authenticity in their words and the way they express themselves and the way they think across in your writing and what that process is like, because it must be quite interesting. I, li- I mean, literally a lot of it was listening. And, uh, you know, I'd spend a lot of time on sort of, when I was on London buses, just listening to young people talk, listening to the, wherever you go, I spent a lot of time on bus, uh, bus stops listening to young people talk. And I think you catch the resonances of London voices a lot. And of course, because London is such a busy place, there are always people and young people about, so I just listen. And I love the rhythms of London voices as well, because they're, they're drawn from so many different nationalities. Um, when my daughter was a teenager, her friends, I'd listen to her friends. And um, I remember at one point, I was sort of sitting uh, sort of in the sitting room and all, you know, having their dominoes. And I was like saying, look, do you really want to have that conversation around me? And I go, oh, Patrice, you know, we're not being rude or explicit. It's like, no, but it might end up in a book. So, you know, I'd take <laughs> their words. Um, I'd sometimes, occasionally, I'd ask my daughter about, because I think there were certain words I'd think about you wouldn't use that word now. So I'd like to say, you know, what, how would you, what word would you use for periods if you've been like colloquial? Or do people say snogging anymore? No, it's lip sync. I thought, oh, I really prefer that. Or, you know, when people are on dating apps, they're talking to each other. So it's a whole conversation about talking and the words of, I suppose like love languages in a way, isn't it? And about how you communicate relationships and all of those things. Um, so I'd ask her a lot as well. But a lot of it was just listening. And I think, I just I suppose, because I am really interested in how people communicate. And again, I think that's just growing up in a household where our communication was that little bit different because of, you know, being the first in my family to be, be born here. So, yeah, that's it, really. I think it's, and it is, it's research, isn't it? It's not taking for granted that my voice is the one voice. I don't want an authorial voice. I want other people's voices because I love other people's voices. <laughs> Nosiness as well. <laughs> Excellent. A discreet <laughs> eavesdropping. <laughs> I love that. I love that you're like, oh, you might not want to say that around me because it might end up in the book. <laughs> right. There's some great yeah. notes on my phone from when I've been on buses when somebody's like, oh, yeah, yeah I love that. <laughs> They're just looking at the text thing, but you put the notes in. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to your daughter's friends and then she's going, could you just say that? Just, just say that one more time. Just one more time. They've been warned. They have been warned. <laughs> I think it's fair enough. Have you got a question you want to ask Mary? Or I feel like everything's been answered. Like, because oh, I don't know. I feel like we've learned so much. <laughs> like, so much. Um, no, I just want to say, like, I love what you've said about sort of giving sort of young women like agency over their bodies and stuff and like you know the way you speak about that it is obviously something that's massively important to you and I think that comes across and I just think I think it's such a relevant important topic and I think it's it really is like amazing how well that you've articulated that and how well you've shown that and I just think it's something that everyone should be really aware of. So, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is obviously something really, Im- yeah. you know, important to me. I think oh, part of it was obviously having a daughter, but then part of it when we think about, you know, to our own teenagehood, and mm-hmm. and the times when maybe we didn't have agency and we thought yeah. we could, and you just think we've got to stop repeating that through generations. And I mean, and the other things actually years ago before I was published, I went to the London Book Fair. I think it's when I was probably writing. Orange Boy and it's the first time I'd been and that's the first time they were doing stuff for authors and um, Mallory Blackman was the um the children's laureate at the time and I didn't just sort of didn't know her then and uh, you know I remember she sort of like came into this big room and I was like trying to discreetly take a photo of her and said it to my daughter so does that look like I'm being a bit stalk- stalkery she'd be like yeah mum so <laughs> I put my phone down. but she said something that was really interesting she said at that time she said her next book might shock people because I think again she, I think she said there was a sex scene in it she said because actually the impact of uh, internet pornography is so profound and on both young men and young women and what it says about relationships. And sometimes the only way that we can counter that is through books. And I thought, absolutely. And I think from that core just stuck in my head that I can do that, you know, my tiny bit of my contribution, if you know, a young person picks up one of my books and thinks, oh, I've got this choice or that choice, so I can do that or I don't do that. And I think if there's a groundswell of that, 
you know, I think, so I don't think internet pornography is going anywhere soon. It makes a lot of money for a lot of people, usually not women. Um, so, you know, we, I suppose, as, as writers that, you know, young adults might read, have to really do our best to, to just push against that and allow young people to see that there are options and different ways of having relationships and different choices. Definitely. Definitely. Um, we've had a, we had a lot of questions about when your kind of interest in writing started and if it's always kind of been there or if you was a reader first and then kind of just decided, oh, I'll try writing a little bit. Because um, we do have some inspiring um, writers in the group there's a couple um that i know of um and i think they're looking for as many tips as possible <laughs> i think it's a little bit more complicated with me because i sort of grew up never thinking that people like me could be authors or characters in books so um you know it's an interesting people say to me you know did you ever want to see yourself represented it wasn't even an option it wasn't something i could possibly consider and a lot of the children's books when I was growing up were probably written, you know, maybe in the first half of the 20th century or before that. And some of them, for instance, like um, the original Hugh Lofton's um, Dr. Doolittle books, which she illustrated, are actually very overtly racist. I mean, it's not like, is it? Or is it? It is. You know, yeah. you know the main character is Prince Bumpo because, you know, Dr. Doolittle goes to Africa. You know, that's not going to end well, you know. And he's kind of like drawn as this caricature and he's like, origin story that the prince is out to get the princess he has to bleach himself white so I kind of read that when I was six you know and also the I remember still really being struck by the illustrations that and you can google them online uh, that he uh, Lofting did of the king and queen of Africa that actually looked like orangutans and I remember literally looking at that and trying to think is that supposed to be people like me and not even equating it but what it does is you kind of absorb this and you internalize this racism thinking I love, you know, and I, my, my foster, because my foster mum, I was fostered from four months to four years because my mum was a sort of single unmarried mother training to be a nurse. And so I was looked after by this other family who were lovely. They were, they were, they were, it was a sort of white working class family in Brighton. They were fantastic. So they taught me to read from an early age, we joined the library, you know, so they encouraged all my creativity. So by the time I started school, I could read, I could, you know, I loved writing and I always loved writing stories. I always loved writing poems. Um, my two brothers are much younger than me, so I used to write them stories and illustrate them. Um, and then I had the two English teachers in secondary school who they're the ones who said, actually, we really think, you know, you're a really good writer and encouraged me to do more with that. And when I sort of hit my teens, I wrote, I got the copy of the Writers and Artists Yearbook. <laughs> um, and I sent some short stories to magazines and the first stories I ever published were, um, romantic I think true romance and I'm so unromantic but like well I you know, got 60 quid for them I'm so happy no. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, so I used to do you know intermittently do things but the idea of being a author or writer is just completely unknown but again I just think for me again that was quite liberating because there's no pressure and I've always just written for pleasure and for the love of it and because it's who I am and the fact it's who I am now and I have books published is amazing but I would have done it anyway because it is part of me in the same mm -hmm. way that people knit or make music or paint it's for me how I artic articulate my world I suppose in writing and it enables me to make sense of my world as well so I just think for people just write your world write because you love it and it's a force you know and then if you want to get published then then you start honing in it editing it but I think the most important thing for me was like finding my voice and because I always wrote white characters for so long, I didn't, ha I didn't have my voice. And it was only when I was 32 <laughs> and I just had a baby. And I was sitting there in a flat in Hackney thinking, God, what do I do with this thing? And I turned on the television. <laughs> uh -oh. and, uh, she's seen this presentation, she doesn't mind. Um, but, um, and it was the, <laughs> it was a BBC adaptation of um, Malu Blackman's Pick Art Boy. And it was like a UK black family, and it was about love and loyalty. It wasn't about gangs and crime, it wasn't a fresh prince of Bel Air. And it suddenly was like this door opened and it gave me permission to think all these things that make me different, you know, my weird multi ethnic families I've always grown up in, the fact that I've never fitted quite here or there is actually what would make me a good writer. 
because I know what it's like to be an outsider, but also sometimes an insider. You know, I've got all these points of reference and all these amazing bits of my life that I can draw into it. And it was such revelation. And for me, I just thought, it doesn't matter if I, you know, even being published wasn't a thought then, but I can write short stories. I love short stories. And I've got boxes of them, but I wrote them because I just love them. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's actually keeping hold to that love of writing because I worry that sometimes when people feel pressured to get published and then they have knockbacks they lose that love of writing and that was so difficult but for me it's just I just love it (laughs) I just do it so do it because you love it and that energy is behind you and it's you yeah I think that's I love hearing that answer because I I'm not a writer I can barely string an Instagram caption together some days well, who can? I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a relationship to write. There is an art. Yeah, yeah. there is an art to Instagram like, captions, honestly. I'm going to run a YA um, online slash in-store week and write press releases and Instagram captions and all that. And I'm like, why have I done that to myself? But I, I'm, I predominantly do art. Yeah. And I think when it's something creative i think you're quite similar to me in that you're trying to understand the world absolutely and, you see. and i think that comes across very well in your writing that it is so kind of an exploration of the everyday stuff that is happening and i think and it's cathartic i think um but also i think the other you know I've said before that I write also because I'm quite angry and I'm really angry at a lot of injustice in the world a lot of people who are are vulnerable I think I need to take my anger somewhere because I I mean I think I mean I mean I suppose in a serious way it's not good for any of our mental health to feel angry all the time and I think the last 18 months I think it's Black Lives Matters and that's sort of all the issues that that's continued I just still feel there's such a, an astounding amount of misogyny in the world as well. Or the women are treated, uh, you know, it makes you incredibly angry. And I just think, you know, again, it's like taking what little bit of power I can find and using that in my writing to try and, I suppose, dispel, <laughs> in a sense, some of, some of that anger. Um, and at the same time, as you said, it's, it's around creativity and it's my, my sort of creativity. I used to have an allotment when I was in London as well. That was incredibly cathartic. The soil was like hard clay. <laughs> <laughs> five hours of breaking up clay feeling like, feeling like you're on a chain gang that was really cathartic note to self get an allotment definitely the clay <laughs> soil, the clay I, feel, soil. <laughs> I feel like that is that should be advice that they give to teachers when they start careers <laughs> it's very rewarding though when all your stuff starts growing in March I used to get so excited <laughs> as I nurse very, the calluses on my hands but yeah <laughs> I like that. I've always thought of like gardening and kind of allotments as like a peaceful and calming thing. But I love that it's just like, no. getting your anger out on the side. Yeah, I love it. I'm hacking this like shrub to shreds, you know. And that's, let's be honest, that's probably why people do it. But they just say, no, I'm such a lovely, calm and peaceful person. Lies. You are <laughs> Yeah, that's why you want like weapons because they are weapons you could yeah, like yeah. kill someone with some garden instruments Absolutely. like so i'm saying really you know that's what you want it for oh yeah i agree <laughs> does anybody have any other questions <laughs> Hi, um i don't know if charlie's gonna ask this but i've got it here in my notes because I feel like everybody always asks what's your favorite book but that's like a really difficult thing to do if you've read a million books so I'm gonna say instead what would be the three books you'd recommend right now to everyone to read that's Um, still a very difficult question did it have to be YA or could it be anything no it can be anything three books you'd recommend the book, A Proof, that I've just read, a YA proof, which I really liked, I don't think it comes out in February, is called The Cats We Meet on the Way by Nadia, is it Nadia Mikkel? Published by Guppy Books. Um, and it won, I think Guppy had a competition, a YA competition, and her book won it. And, and I think it's why I love independent presses, because that whole thing about they take risks and, and publish something that's different. 
is set in Malaysia. I think the author is a law student in, in the UK. I'm presuming from Malaysian background, but I didn't check. And in a sense, it's about there's an asteroid that's going to hit the world in, in four months' time. And everybody's known, the scientists knew about it, but people have just known. Uh, but it's not a big dystopian story. It's actually a very small family about a family that knows this is going to happen. And the sister has been estranged from the girl. So the girl, her boyfriend, and the two families just go in this camper van through Malaysia to go and find a sister. And in a sense, it goes like about making amends and to. And it's just lovely and beautiful and unusual. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I really loved um, Ingrid Perso's Love After Love, which was shortlisted for the Costa. Uh, and it won the um, debut novel uh, Costa last year. And it's by a Trinidadian Indian author. And it's one of those things when people talk about writing others and then you know, I get asked a lot about that should write white writers write you know etc etc um for me it's always you know the question is you need to know why you are the right person to tell a particular story and that's just the answer you know why are you telling that story and what can you bring to it and that story set in Trinidad um it's like nobody I think could write that story apart from Ingrid Purcell because about the Trinidadian Indian characters, Mr. Mr. Chetan, who's gay, and uh, Miss, oh, I can't remember her name, but she's a woman who has experienced domestic violence at the beginning, and um, they end up, you know, he's, he, Mr. Chetan is a lodger for a while, and she's sort of, uh, it's just, it's, the voices are amazing, and it's funny, and there's bits of, but on my days, my auntie used to say that, and I'd just forgotten about it. There's even a character called Uncle Baby, and I have an auntie baby who's in her 80s, and when I do school visits, then everybody in the Caribbean has an uncle and auntie baby and nobody remembers what their original <laughs> name was. There's <laughs> lots of food in it, which for me, food is, is the absolute, you know, absolute thing. Um, and so I just think it's, I, I, I just absolutely love that book. And when I do workshops about food, particularly for adults, I take a section where she's making this fish curry and about, you know, about what it says and, and how you use it. Absolutely love that. Then I love Geoffrey Boachie's books. Um, so it's a toss up between, and Geoffrey, if you don't know, he's a, a teacher. He was um, born and brought up, Ghanaian heritage in Lambert, South London, and lives with his, his wife and children now in Doncaster, where he teaches. And his first book is called, was published by Influx, again, a small um, uh, press based in Hackney, and that was called Hold Tight. And it was, uh, it was a story, it was about looking at black masculinity um, through grime, 62 grime tracks. And I don't even like grime, but actually it's really interesting how he tags it on. His second one, which I recommend to all writers who are writing others, is called Black, Comma, Listed. And what he's done is taken all the words, and he writes with great humour, is incredibly funny. And he writes, um, looking at the words, of all the words around blackness, and some of them are, and he puts them in categories, so some of them are meant to be like neutral, some are insult, some are insider words, you know, and then things like lunchbox, so about when Linford Christie used to run, then all the focus was on the content of his like shorts, and it was described as his lunchbox, and how, you know, Jeffrey says how uncomfortable he felt about that, but that was like, go, you know, so there's all of those words, and I think it's fantastic looking about how words shape identity, and who has power over words, but his recent one, which I think is just perfect for schools, which is a school book, is called um, Musical Truth. And I'm so jealous I didn't come up with the idea. Uh, so basically, <laughs> it's <laughs> black, and I've interviewed him about it as well, so I'm so jealous. Oh, yes! <laughs> yes. <laughs> I recommend that absolutely for schools, because what's frustrating for me is around Black History Month, even though there shouldn't be one, is such an opportunity, but quite often schools do. Um, it's like Nelson Mandela, Rosa Parks, or Martin Luther King. So what you're saying is to black kids is like, mate, you've got to go to prison for years and years and years. <laughs> and actually, but also there's so much British history as well. That, and it's not just the wind rush, there's so much. And what he does with musical truth is again, he uses a framework of, of um, music and to each track, and I think there's 23 tracks. So it starts with Lord Kitchener's London is a place for me and ends up with like Stormy and Jay and, and Dave and some others looking at the sort of Black Lives Movement. And each, under each bit, there's a bit about Black uh, British history. And it's such a fantastic framework as well. And, and also just really interesting about music, starting with like the um, Trinidadian Calypsonians who came here with the wind draft and some went back. And then you sort of move to, um, I suppose, Black British, um, 
British born musicians and a sort of mixed heritage musicians like Nana Cherry and Sade. And then, of course, with the sort of like the grime movement, they're mostly African heritage. So it's really interesting again. But it's written specifically for schools and uses music as that framework. And I think there's also like a Spotify or YouTube list as well. And I really recommend that, even though I'm so jealous. But. <laughs> it, it is, it's, it's, it's good. It, it's just wonderful. And again, it's another one that just has incredible instruments. Yeah. Oh, yes, it does. Illustrations. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and that's what it, the other thing I liked about it was actually, I suppose, since going back to the beginning of Queen and Splinters of Sunshine, is that with Queen, it was my mum who liked Queen at the beginning when I was a kid, because um, even I was little when like, Bohemian Rhapsody came out of like primary school. But actually, you know, my mum loved Queen, then I loved Queen. Then, but my daughter knows all those tracks. I don't even remember teaching her. And when I looked at, you know, a lot of that music in, in Jeffrey's book, the songs that just take me back to like the soul to soul thing, you know, growing up in Sussex and like London seems so cool because of soul to soul and Jazzy B and then like some of the later tracks who Stormzy and Dave are sort of musicians that my daughter's introduced me to and we've like kind of looked at those tracks together. And then, you know, that Lord Kitchener when he came over, I knew, I didn't know London as a place for me. I knew his earlier tracks because he's Trinidadian. So the mm -hmm. first time I went to Trinidad, I was six, and my auntie had like Lord Kitchener playing. So it's the way that music it sort of weaves through history and just creates, you know, memories as well. So I think all of that's in that book. And I thought, oh, well done, Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It's it's very good book, and we're quite lucky because um, we're. The rabbit hole's based in Brig, so Doncaster's only. Oh, cool. Okay. The 30, 30 minutes away. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I don't know as much about this book as Nick does, who's um, one of the owners of The Rabbit Hole. Um, so Nick is like the resident music buff and just adores anything music. Um, and he knows a lot about, of, about that book. And we are hoping we can get Jeffrey to come to the store at some point in the next I'm year. sure he would. I'm really sure he would. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great book. So if, if, that, if that didn't sell it to you, it's a great book. And it's oh, I think, I think I'm quite sold. I have yeah. a list. Yeah. I'm trying to limit my book purchasing. This is not good. Nice. I think I think the book it's a book that you can dip in and out of, and I think that of all of Jeffrey's books. But I think for schools particularly, and I think it's around again about that critical thinking about how we look at our collective history, and because history is always being seen through one particular eye and one particular lens. And I think for me, even me reading some of that, and I've had to educate myself because most of the things, you know, I didn't know that soldiers came from the Caribbean in the first or second world war until way until I was in my thirties because nobody told me. And I just think, you know, again, it looks at history through a different lens and about, um, and, and it gives black people agency, I suppose, whereas before we've always been secondary ca characters to sort of history that's learned at school. So I think it's kind of a clever way of doing it is using music as a framework, but it's actually about so much more. I kind of like the music bit still. So. <laughs> yeah, the music bits in there are incredible, but I do think, as you say, it's a very good vessel for a wider, it's a framing device, basically, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's great. So before we all say goodbye, unless Diane has any more questions. Oh, Mary. I'm done. You're done. Oh. <laughs> and we all have to prepare for the Bake Off final as well. Oh, so, yeah. oh. oh. I haven't seen it. <gasps> I am so stressed. <laughs> what, well, I... I haven't seen it or that it's the finale? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> Well, I'm really excited. I'm a bit I'm cross, but yeah. <laughs> why? Why are you cross? Last week. Can you believe it? I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Shocked. Could not believe it. Oh, I was so shocked. Yeah. It's like they're going for the they're going for like the best hair competition because like the finalists have all got excellent hair, haven't they? I know. So it's 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 yeah. You wonder about how much decisions are made by the production company because that's actually a Mickey take, I think. But you know, I feel <laughs> so like I'm gonna have to go back and watch this. I've never seen 
a full episode of Beowulf in my oh, my life. Out because it is brilliant. Get um, out. Get I just out. I find it just again one of those therapeutic things. I think yeah. I want to watch people being nice to each other and making cake, no. and that just yeah. makes me happy. And <laughs> and I, I feel like that is it. They make me hungry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't <laughs> bake. Like I'm not. You don't have to. to. They do. That's the thing. Yeah, so they, like, yeah. They bake. <laughs> I get hungry. What am I supposed to do? Oh, uh, do you know what? We always, always eat cake on Bake Off Night. <laughs> like, you just have to. You can't be sat there watching it and not eating. Cause it's just wrong. It is wrong. I'm like, making sausages and mash so comfort food will get me through. I know. I know. I totally get it. Totally get it. And it's like, it's probably, I think, because because I'm not, I'm not British in any way, shape or form. Then I moved here when I was 14. And so I think it's my, it's the most British thing I do is every autumn I watch the Bake Off. Every, <laughs> like without fail, I will watch it. I'm obsessed with it. Oh, do you remember when it moved from the BBC to Channel 4? Oh, the, the absolute, the scandal. And then when Mary <laughs> Berry left. I could not believe it. I was like, <gasps> I like <laughs> Noel. I must admit, I like Noel. It surprised me. Oh, I love uh, him. He surprised me. I love him. I think yeah. he's hilarious. I've loved Noel since he did Mighty Boosh, though. Yeah. And when I heard that he was doing Bake Off, I was like, I don't understand how that's going to... Exactly, yeah. ...going to translate, but it, it really did. It's it really warm really and is. kind and natural. It is. It's so yeah. nice. Yeah. I, I do. feel like I'm missing out on a whole lot right now. You yeah. really are. <laughs> it is, I, mean, I, think, I think it is, yeah. I think it's actually for me, it's just people being nice to each other. Yeah. And that's yeah. just so nice yeah. to each other. Yeah. We, my, my partner and I said this, if this is an American show, right, they'd all be trying to like sabotage each other. Yeah. Things, or they'd be <laughs> horrible. Or they'd be like, yeah. like oh, look at that shade of green that Giuseppe used or something like that, right? But no, in this, everyone is so supportive. <laughs> oh, it's so, so good. good. But uh, I've got quite a lot of friends that I speak to in America that watch Bake Off and they're all like, is that what England's really like? <laughs> I mean, we don't live in sense, but like... <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh, please don't shatter their dreams. <laughs> Like it is. is. That's exactly like we all bake together, and it's, it's really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it should be. That's the utopia. Yes, yes, exactly. it is. Bake Off is like a little slice of heaven, and then Paul Hollywood comes in. But you know, yeah, we can't have it all. We can't have it all. But we do get um, our amazing. Yeah. Paul Hollywood is our reminder that real life exists. That what he's, yes. That's what he's doing there. <laughs> that women can't be that little bit. Do it, but yeah. yeah, he's that little bit of cynicism in the yeah. show that you're. Yeah, true. Oh, yeah. it is a competition. <laughs> so. One of you is going to go. Yeah. 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 I, I'm definitely missing out. I'm going to have to you really are. binge watch them all tonight or something. I will get back to you all with my views. <laughs> So before we go, do you want to give a quick, if possible, little summing up of Splinter's Sunshine? Um, and then I will let you all get off to watch Bake Off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so do we all want to give a little thing or should we just leave it to the incredible author? Let, ooh, let's save it to the incredible author. Yes. <laughs> I, you well, sold our, you already sold books to us so well, so I feel like you've, you've got this. No, nobody can sell their own book. Well, women can't generally. Yeah, Splinters of Sunshine is a book about a 15-year-old boy called Spay. He's like really high achieving. Wakes up on Christmas morning to find a daddy never knew. Fresh out of prison and asleep on his sofa. They go on a road trip from London through to Brighton to find his nursery, to find his childhood friend, uh, Dee, who he knows is in some trouble. And it's a book about friendships, about fatherhood, about wildflowers, and also about Freddie Mercury. <laughs> You've sold it so well. Like, I'm going to read it again because, like, oh, it's so good. 
No, it is. It's an incredible book. I think it really is. It's the most kind of like my phone during the time everyone was reading this didn't stop buzzing. Oh, at all. Well, thank you. Like, <laughs> thank you. People, um, everyone loved it. Um, and it is just one of those books that like the characters are still with me yeah. and I still remember it. And it's not a book that you kind of put down and then it's gone about. It's, it's not gone. It's a, it's a really incredible book. And I think you capture real life and real people and make everything feel so real. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. It's really kind. It. Thank you. And I it, it is deeply it. moving. You cannot read it without tissues. Nice. It's oh, so good. My job is moving. done. Yes. <laughs> it's such yeah. a t good. Oh, oh, I cried so well. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think um, everyone in the group cry. <laughs> I've recommended it to so many of the families that I work with and so many schools that I go into, but to so many of the parents that I work with as well. Because um, I think it's like, it's such a relevant book for it's such a relevant book for everyone. I just think it's like, although it's quite sad, obviously it's still full of hope. And I just yeah. think it's a really beautifully told story. And we ordered some copies as well for our school library. So oh, this was actually in um, one of our reading lists for last term. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I hope you've all had fun. Yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> thank you for agreeing to be part of the interview. It's no, I really nice. appreciate you reading it, but I really do. Thank oh, you. We loved it. Loved it. Everybody absolutely adored it. And I think since we've all read it we've all passed it on and i don't think i've heard a single person that's read it that hasn't either cried <laughs> or <laughs> or like absolutely just adores it because i think it's a it's a very relatable book but it's really powerful as well and it it kind of balances on that really really good line of like being an enjoyable read, but saying a lot at the same yeah. time. So oh, that's cool. My job is done. <laughs> Thank you, you did it incredibly well. I loved it.